Let's talk about those five years. So you uh, you you are from Duluth, Morgan Parker, yeah, you know, the whole deal, and uh, done some some traveling. Been an entertainer since what a long time. You've been yeah, since I met you in '96. Well, yeah. that's when you started doing music, but you've yeah. been doing DJing. Yeah, and you've been writing music all along. Been writing for a long time. Yeah, probably since the late '80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really bad songs too. No, they're not all bad. We won't be doing those songs. Oh, the early songs. The early songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you went out to California, and I, 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 you set out to meet like you had some like almost idols like Chris Isaac, and uh, um, that's that's I lost it there. Well, <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> well, you know, obviously my main influences is you know the the early guys, you know, Buddy Holly, uh, Ricky Nelson, Elvis. Uh, Roy Orbison, the Everly Brothers, you know, that, that, that 50s rock and roll stuff, you know, Eddie Cochran, Gene Vincent, uh, you know, Carl Perkins, even the old country stuff, Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, George Jones, God, God bless your soul, George, yeah. we miss you already. Uh, yeah, all the Roots ty- style music, that's what I'm influenced by, for sure. When you were out there, you were you started to play though with a lot of professional musicians and session guys and a lot of great guys out there, guys that have played you know drums for Dwight Yoakam, steel guitar for Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty, uh, you know a lot of lot of talented guys out there and girls obviously too. So um, yeah, it, it, it's completely endless the amount of talented people out in that area. To me, that, that's one of the reasons I did leave because I, I just felt like, uh, I, I don't know, there was just a lot, there's a lot of guys out there that do my style of music, you know? And I just felt, uh, I felt a little, not invaded, but a little, it felt a little crowded to me, you know? It's a big city, right? Mm-hmm. It's a big city. I mean, Duluth has one freeway. <laughs> and, you know, and it's not even a freeway. I mean, it's just two lanes, you know. It's And then, you know, when we do get rush hour traffic here, we, like, sit and complain about it. And I'll tell you, folks, you don't know what rush hour traffic is till you're sitting on the 405 in L.A., that's for sure. The, the crowded nature of it, the, uh, you know, all these different people, all kinds of talented people, and you, you're this Morgan Park guy that goes out there. And a lot of people that go to L.A. are from, a lot of them are from small towns, you know. A lot of them come all over the world. The thing is, is I think for me, I think I may have went out there a little late in my career. You know, I went out in my mid-40s. And most people that are into the music scene, you know, uh, you know they get out there in their 20s or their 30s and they get their foot in the ground. You know, you, you get planted out there. And once you get planted out there, I think it's a lot easier. But if you would have gone out there, you would have been out there with the, whatever, L.A. Guns and Guns and Roses oh, and, all, and all. I don't know about that. So, well. <laughs> so maybe the timing was right. I mean, there was, <laughs> there, there, I mean, your music is, I don't know if it's anachronistic or, or what, but I mean, it's like, it's, you say roots. You talk about a group root style. Uh, you know. Roots, I mean, that music kind of came from a rhythm and blues, you know. Uh, uh, Big Mama Thornton, you know. I mean, she's the one that recorded Hound Dog, and that's where Elvis heard it from, you know. And uh, that kind of music, just basically the three different chords. This chord structure is all the kind of the same, you know. Just uh, you got your one, you got your two, or your four, and then your five. That's all you got. So you basically just got one, four, five formats with some minors thrown in once in a while. And that's, you know, it, that's how Hank Williams did it back in the day. You didn't need all these crazy chords. You just needed a good melody and some good words, you know. Simplistic. I like that, you know. Well, I want to hear a couple, at least a couple of the originals that you're going to be playing. Sure. So uh, why don't you introduce one? Sure, I'm gonna do. Let's do. Let's do Lucky Star since I got. Uh, I'm in the uh, the mode here. Um, 
uh, we'll do this song called Lucky Stars. And a lot of my songs are uh, influenced uh, by the girl that I've been seeing uh, out in California. And that's the main reason I did move out there. That's uh, my lovely gal, Laura DeWitt. And, uh, and I wrote a lot of songs while we were apart. You know, a lot of songs uh, came from that. So this song is called Lucky Stars, and I wrote this uh, for her. Mm -hmm. I've had my heartaches, I've burned some bridges. I've had my dreams walk away down the road I've never seen what I'd been missing until the day I met a woman like you It won't be right till I'm holding you forever There's nothing wrong stars from above I'd lie to myself and make up stories I'd roam from town to town selling all my blues I gave that all up the day I found you the reason and the best damn excuse It won't be right till I'm holding you forever There's nothing wrong with the way you love And all this time stars from above It won't be right till I'm holding you forever Nothing wrong with the way you love And all this time you were always waiting for me I have to thank my lucky stars from above I have to thank my lucky stars from above Stars from above. So that song was what was it? Lucky Star. It's called Lucky Stars. Yeah. So I thank my lucky stars for her. Yeah. Exactly. So talk about Laura. Talk about Laura, Laura Joe. Oh, boy. I don't know. If she hears this, she ain't going to want me to talk about her. She's a very private person. Uh, and she's probably the... She's not probably. She's uh, she's the most incredible person I've ever met in my life. She changed my life dramatically as far as who I am as a man. You united in part over music. Yes, she came out to a concert that I did out in L.A. in 06 called a little place called the Lava Lounge, and she met me there, and it was kismet from then on. 
And uh, we started off doing a long distance thing. And at the moment, we're doing the long distance thing again as I move back here in October. And I have to tell you, I will not suggest it to anybody. It is very, very difficult. One thing you have to have is trust. You have to communicate. I mean, that's with any relationship, but it's even doubly as hard when you're 2,000 miles away. And, and musician, artist types, uh, radio types, we are hard to be in a relationship with. Oh, geez. Yeah. I got to pat them all on the back just for putting up with us for all these years. You're a woman, too. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, you went out to the Lava Lounge, and that was kind of a dream trip for you. It was. I always wanted to play there. Uh, one of my favorite surf bands called the Blue Hawaiians was playing there. And uh, they uh, obviously, they did the music for the SpongeBob uh, TV oh, show. They I did a lot know. of the instrumentals for that, the Blue Hawaiians, yes. And uh, it was a surf bar, and, I, and that's when tiki and surf stuff was, was really big again, like in, you know, the, the mid-2000s, you know. You probably remember that, all that lounge stuff. And I saw that, and I don't know, I just, uh, I wanted to go, and I wanted to play there. So I flew the entire band out there, and uh, we had a great time. Unfortunately, I didn't see him after I met Laura. It was, I gave him the keys to the van, and I said, you're on your own, boys. <laughs> Good luck in Hollywood. Another uh, personal relationship thing, and this kind of goes with the Hawaiian and the, you know, uh, um, with the your interest in design and retro design is uh, your good friend passed away. Talk about that. Uh, his name was Doug Moen, and most people should know who Doug Moen was. He was one of the greatest man, men I ever knew in my life. He was a avid collector of just about everything. He was a... Uh, one of the kindest souls you'll ever meet. And uh, he passed away a few months ago. So it's been hard. So uh, uh, he helped me a lot with vintage stuff as far as what to wear, the period pieces. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of mid-century. Anything 50s, 60s, you know, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Elvis. I love that. I love the aesthetic of it all. I don't know. For some strange reason, a lot of people always ask, they say, why, do you, why are you... Why are you drawn to that? And I, I don't know. I, and I honestly think that we all at some point lived before we live now in the past somehow, you know, like we're different souls. Like, I don't know. I just, I feel like I have to, I have, I have to have that stuff around me. It, it comforts me. It's like anything. Why do people collect Star Wars toys? Not because they're geeks. It's because it probably brings out the child in them when they, you know, when they were a child, it, it brings back really good memories, you know? So for me, living with my grandparents most of my life in a mid-century house, whenever I see an old grandma couch, I gotta have it. <laughs> it's just simple like that. Or an old song like that. I gotta hear it. You know, it's just, I'm an old soul like that. And that's how Doug was too. Doug was a really old soul and he knew his stuff. And uh, so I decided to write a song for Doug. Do, can you play that? I, I certainly can. It's a, it's a beautiful song called My Sweet Friend. And uh, I played it at Doug's uh, memorial, uh, which was just a couple of months ago at Clyde. And uh, it's, it's not easy to do. So uh, thank God we're not on video here. This is called My Sweet Friend. Outside my window Snow is falling down Once again And outside my doorway I can still feel your breath Through the wind And since you've been gone I have not been the same the days feel like years and the tears show all of the pain I feel my sweet friend So I walk through the forest 
just to hear your voice through the trees. And I climbed up a mountain so I could touch your face in the sky. And I look to the east and I look to the west. And all through this life, your love's the best love I've seen. My sweet friend. And I look to the east and I look to the west. And all through this life, your love's the best love I've seen My sweet friend My sweet friend My So Doug had the costume shop. That's that's where a lot of people met him. I met him when I was working at the. Well, I met him, but I worked very closely with him when I was at the North Shore. Yeah, and uh, he started off downtown, you know, with lots of crazy shops. I first met him in uh, 1985. I was living in the cities at the time, and uh, I came up here for a, kind of a like a. I was looking for kind of like a Duran Duran style trench coat. Do you remember the new wave stuff was really big with trench coats back in the day? Did you do the, like the buttons on the lapel and stuff like that too? Uh, I had buttons on my lapel. I'm not going to no, lie. No, I didn't. I don't know if I did the buttons on the lapel. You know lapel. what I'm talking yeah, about yeah, though? Yeah, I know. No, I did not do that. So anyway, so that's when I first met Doug and he gave me a deal on this jacket. Like, like he always did. He'd always give anybody a deal. And I still have that jacket. And, uh, I will never forget the day that I met him. And then when I moved back from the cities in 96, uh, then I really started to get to know Doug. I ran into his costume shop, which was right above, uh, over by the La Petite Coffee Shop, which is where I started doing my first gigs. And he was right above the Capri there. And I'd, I'd go in there for Halloween. And then uh, as the years went by, Doug and I formed a really good friendship. Um, in fact, uh you know, I got to see Doug just right before he died. You know, we had uh, we had breakfast down in Moose Lake at a little cafe called Arts Cafe, and there was there's only two cafes down in Moose Lake, and uh, he wanted to go to Arts because it was old. Anything that was old and rustic, you know, like that, that's where Doug wanted to go. He didn't want to go to the fancy new places. So we sat there and we had coffee and we shared stories and. And uh, the last time I saw him was right outside this apartment, right out here, right outside my doorway as the snow was falling down. Mm -hmm. So that's why that song is so personal. So. Now, this, these thoughts about, you say mid-century um, and the styles, and I remember when in kind of the lounge and the, the lounge era when when swingers remember Vince Vaughn and all those guys came oh, out yeah, with them from swingers yeah and uh, you know when the when the sort of that swing music and then there was kind of the lounge era and uh, the other one that seems like it's in vogue now or maybe it's fading a little bit is the early sixties with the whole uh, the mad people always talking about Mad, mad Men and yeah. Don Draper mm -hmm. and stuff like that yeah. And so, but that's a little bit later. That's starting to get late for you and your interests, isn't it? Uh, actually, the, uh, the the early '60s were great. Uh, the, the clothing lines were really nice. They were real straight, and the sky, the ties were real skinny. But when you started getting into the late '70s, when you or, or late '60s, when you started getting into like uh, uh, like Janis Joplin when she started coming out and uh, Woodstock, uh, then you're starting to see a lot of the flower power stuff you know a lot of psychedelic colors you're starting to see all those orange and flowery things and then you're starting to see bell bottoms 
and really wide lapels, just really hideous, to me, hideous clothing. Uh, even Frank Sinatra, as he got older, him and Dean Martin, they'd wear bow ties as big as their head. Do you remember that? No. In the 70s? Oh, it was just awful. And in the, the ruffle, the kind of ruffle. The ruffles, yeah. The ruffled shirts and, oh my God. Thinking of Jimi Hendrix with ruffles. That's a lot of polyester back then. I'm, I'm not a fan of polyester too much. It just, uh, especially if you're somewhere, it is itchy, it's uncomfortable, it's tight. And uh, it's just, it's awful. I hate the, hate the feeling of polyester. You always got to wear a t-shirt or something underneath. We got a email on, uh, must have been Sunday night or Monday night. Some, somebody was, uh, or on Monday morning, was uh, calling about, we, we do like a lot of old time country early in the mornings. And then on Saturday, we have this uh, this where we're doing the George Jones and you know and, and even even before that Chet Atkins and and stuff like that and this guy was saying something like they just don't it's just not the same mm-hmm. once you get into what I and that's with country music so I'm thinking of the 70s and for sure the 80s but it seems like there's like a like kind of a drop off in your music like that you know and not not in your music but in the style right. that you're that you're playing were you just um I think Garth Brooks changed everything for country music. I really do. I mean, is he the culprit? Is he to blame? I mean, yeah, he did write some good songs, but he kind of incorporated the whole arena rock setting for country music. And then Shania Twain followed. And of course, a lot of people don't realize Shania Twain's uh, husband and producer at the time produced Def Leppard, Def Leppard, Loverboy, Brian Adams. So you had all those. I mean, when you listen to old Shania Twain records and you hear those background vocals, you can't even you can't even do those vocals live. They're all like processed, like Def Leppard backing vocals. I mean, it, it sounded more like rock. And then, of course, they were selling her as a, you know, a sexual commodity as well. Uh, you know, showing her midriff. Remember that? I midriff mean, was big, She yeah. wasn't even like, uh, I don't think uh, the Grand Old Opry was appreciative of her music. She wasn't popular back in the day. And then that followed with other artists. I mean, I mean, it's all, music is all personal taste. You got people that think Jimmy Buffett is country. And you got people that think, uh, you know, Trace Atkins is country. I mean, it's is he country or is he rock? Is he bordering? He's kind of teetering on that whole thing. You don't really know. Uh, so I, t- my personal opinion, the last time country music was good was probably when Eddie Rabbit was around. And that, I know, it sounds kind of funny, but... That early 80s music, and you know who was popular back then too, was George Strait. And George Strait is still one of my favorites today. I mean, he still puts out a good country record. But uh, there's... So, but Eddie Rabbit, that to me... Do you you remember the... You might... We don't remember this necessarily, but there was sort of the rift of... uh, of Willie Nelson and Johnny Cat, the Highwaymen, you yes. know Chris Christopherson, yep. Yep. and they they almost like left Nashville. Yeah, and and to me, the, and this is my, again, it's so personal taste stuff. But to me, the Eddie Rabbit was that kind of the Crystal Gale and, and stuff. It was, like it was a little light, wasn't it? He was a great songwriter, though. I mean, I'm not, I'm not just, ta- I'm not talking just listening. To I love a rainy night or driving my life away. He's got other songs that are really catchy and hooky. I mean, but and they're really well written, structured songs. He's got kind of an old school, and he obviously he left us way too early. I mean, he died in his early 40s from lung cancer. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't beat Waylon Jennings, uh, Merle Haggard, uh, all those guys. I mean, who's going to replace them? Well, that's kind of where that's kind of where I was going with the questions. Is that you stay in this era, and so if, whether it's Mad Men with the early '60s, or whether it's uh, when uh, when the Bell Bottoms and all that stuff came back, Shania Twain was part of that, or whatever. You know, like the mm-hmm. kind of the the '60s uh, or '70s, uh, even the uh, maybe not so much the disco, but I mean, there's these some of these things are cyclical, but you kind of stay. With this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to yeah. do pop standards and, and 
you know, and well, whatever. you got to create an identity. I mean, that's the thing. You got to find out who you are as an artist. And that's the hardest thing. And then once you do, then it's easy because you know your, you know your borders. You know what you can do. Talk about what happened to Hot Toddy. Where, oh, Hot, where's Hot Toddy? God. I can't believe he just brought that up. Well, I, you know, I have, uh, I was trying to find your, uh, your phone number. I was looking for your phone number, and I got about three phone numbers. And on one of the phone numbers, there's a Hot Toddy email attached oh. to it, and that oh. changed. And that's what I do. Well, I ask these things. Well, you know what? I, I, the, the name came... F- from a gal named Nikki, she lived in the cities. I was living in the cities, and I just started doing coffee shops in about 95. And we were listening to, at the time, a lot of, like, ultra lounge discs that were put out by Capitol Records. And they were, like, the big thing. And uh, there was a song from Julie London, great crooner, jazz lady. She came out with a song called Hot Toddy. It's an old standard written by Ralph Flanagan years ago, probably in the 30s, 40s. But there is a song called Hot Toddy. It goes, do, 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 do. And there's actually lyrics to it and everything. And she's like, you ought to call yourself that because you're kind of loungy. And I'm like, really? People ain't going to think because my name is Todd. I'm not like calling myself hot and describing myself. Now, it'd be different if my name was Frank, you know, when I call myself Hot Toddy. That would be completely different. Hey, Frank, I like the name of that band, you know. Hey, Todd. Hey, Hot Toddy. Hey, Todd. Toddy. Hot Toddy. Give me a You know, it's just, it, you know, after a while, after I moved back up here in 96, I think on the local scene, I got a lot of flack for that name. Uh, you did? Oh, totally. I would go to... I used to I used to do Sir Benedict's every Friday night and it was jam packed and I would put posters up on the up on the wall around the street and people would literally black or x out my face and write obscenities on my posters. I mean, we're talking like you know, I I can't really say, but they would basically call me names and whatever and you know, so In fact, I did a gig up at Papa Charlie's, and for those of you that go up to Papa Charlie's, in the back room, the dressing room, uh, I signed my name up there when I played up there years ago, probably back in 99, and then somebody put obscenities after that, too, so it doesn't matter where I went. So in 2005, I decided to drop the hot toddy name and just call myself by my my name, and uh, that's what I should have did in the beginning. Did you feel like you had, did you think you had something to prove going out to Los Angeles? Oh, yeah, I did. You know, this is, so so we're in homegrown week and and everybody's um, talking about, you know, all these bands and how people people don't always get along. And sometimes it is hard to get gigs and and sometimes um, there are different strains let's say or clicks or whatever and there are yeah there are certain people i know for a fact in this town that hang out with certain people and that's how it is it's uh it's a little bit like high school in a way uh i just you know i i pick and choose where i want to go and who i want to hang out with and and those people do the same and that that's just how it is music is music is art though so i appreciate all of it Mm -hmm. whether or not i like it or not that's another thing. And people can say the same thing about the music that I do. You know, they may appreciate what I'm doing, but you don't necessarily have to like it. It's just personal taste. Some of the guys, well, you played with a lot of guys, but talk about some of the people um, in the, well, you're playing with the Fractals. You can talk about those guys, but maybe some of the other artists that that have been around and, and have, you know, just settled into who they are and how you can almost just pick up with them and, play music for three hours yeah uh when i first well when i first moved back the the north shore before i think you were managing it uh i I think rick boo was managing it at the time and uh they used to do open mic nights and i would host some of the open mic nights that's right yeah back in the day up in the mezzanine up there and uh and i remember when max dakota first moved Mm -hmm. to town I actually have some old recordings of that and a lot of great people that I met through the years. I think even Jason Wusso might have showed up 
back in the day, the owner of Beaners. And, uh, and then another gig that I did at Sir Benedict's, our bass player couldn't make it. And uh, uh, for those of you that know who I'm talking about, you'll find this interesting. And I said, does anybody play bass out there? And there's the guy out in the audience that says, I do, man. And uh, I was like, uh, okay, well, we got a bass up here for you. He goes, man, that won't work. And I said, why, why is that? Why won't the bass work? He goes, because I'm left-handed, man. They call me lefty. And that's Larry Sandman. He did our, and he had just first moved to town too as well, as well. And he did a gig with us and he sat in and he went home and got his bass and he just kind of worked through it. And then, of course, Lefty and I played together for, for years doing the Dragon Boat Festival. And then, uh, and that, and then I started uh, hanging out with Barry Perkola, a great guitar player, steel player for the Fractals. And uh, we, we did a bunch of Elvis shows together. And then that's how I met Jimmy Cooper, who is uh, one of the best guitar players I've ever seen in my life. He's, he's, he's an amazing guitar player. He can figure out any song in a matter of seconds. He's a machine. He's not human. So he uh, is playing on the uh, upcoming Aurora Bear record. He's also uh, playing with uh, a Jason Wusso and Friends, and I believe they have a brand new name now. What is it? Uh, they came up with a name last night. What oh, was last f- night? Fuzzy something. Fuzzy... Uh, not fuzzy navel, it's something fuzzy. I don't know, but he plays with Jason and he and he does a finger style thing and uh, a lot of great people I've got to play with. Ethan Thompson, uh, who works uh, down at uh, Grand Central Music, and Luke Perry, the drummer. Uh, those two go regularly and tour with uh, blues sensation uh, Becky Barksdale. Really. They tour with her regularly when she's touring the Midwest. Yeah, and Becky, of course, used to be Michael Jackson's guitar player. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. So Luke and Ethan get the the tour with them. And then there's another guy that works. He's a good, really good friend of mine. His name is John Sagwin, and he has got one of the best voices I've ever heard in my life. So John and I have done a lot of shows together, and especially like Everly Brothers shows together, uh, us harmonizing. So... Uh, a lot of great musicians I've met in this town. I'm probably leaving out a hundred more. Mm-hmm. There's, it just, it, is it just me or is there just a huge amount of talent in this little town? Well, I think that you and I specifically know a lot of musicians. So if you were to probably ask some housewife in her 50s that doesn't go out much, she probably wouldn't know, you know. Uh, what I think we have here is a really close niche of people that's you know kind of stay together and they know each other and uh if you're into the music and art scene if that's what you're into uh there's a lot there's a lot out there and there's a lot to choose from Uh, but you have to be in that you know you have to jump in that bloodstream you gotta jump in that blood pool you know and get yourself aboard that wonderful art train i guess so they call it but if you're sitting at home and you're not going out and supporting live music and you're eating popcorn and butterfingers and watching old reruns or TV and stuff, you're you're not you're not getting to see the great music and art scene here in Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. That you know, that's what I always used to say that our we're not competing with other places or other bands. You know, it's not about uh who else is playing tonight. You know, the big competition is who's sitting you know at home with the remote in their hand like though that's the huge pool of people you know and you get the smaller pool that that people are are competing over but i digress so i got a couple more questions i want to ask you about but do you have do you have another song you can do i got a song here that's uh that it's a true story about my life obviously all the stuff that i write is not made up it's it's about me or my personal life i'm not making up some fictitious thing about uh, eleanor rigby or those crazy guys yeah 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 you know i mean the beatles you can't even want to go that way i just haven't done enough drugs i guess to be (laughs) able to do that but here's a song that i wrote that is very johnny cash inspired i'm gonna move this this way because this is gonna get a little loud but um and we'll be performing this uh would it be tonight at uh thursday tonight at norm's beer and broads yeah this is the true story here there's a song that's uh well it's johnny cash inspired a little bit here the best I can. Well, I 
I've been down this road before I've seen one too many open doors And I'm giving you a reason To doubt your man But under the circumstances I'm doing the best I can You see my daddy was a bastard My mama was a thief They took away my innocence And they stole me dignity And they hung me out to dry Without a plan And under those circumstances I'm doing the best I can Don't try to take it so personally I know you have your own share of misery And I know you're only doing what's best for me But under those circumstances I'm doing the best I can Yeah! I feel my back's up against the wall I'm leaving it to you, honey, it's your call And I'm giving you a reason to doubt your man But under my circumstances, I'm doing the best I can Doing the best I can I'm doing the best I can I'm doing the best I can What's a what's the Todd Eckhart show like? A Todd Eckhart show. Um well, a Todd Eckhart homegrown show where you got 45 minutes <laughs> and you just got to jump into the next song without talking. I like to talk, I like to educate people. Um I'm one of those kind of guys uh, where I like to get out in the audience and interact a lot, get the crowd involved, do a lot of uh, ad-libbing, uh, you know, off-the-cuff stuff. Uh, I don't like stuff pre-planned too much. I like to just kind of go with it. Um, I, for, for your material. For my material. Uh, no, but for your material, but... But for your your tribute shows or or uh, like when I do like a Frank Sinatra, those, Dean Martin, those are those seem very uh, choreographed and planned. Uh, out. Those, those are well. I mean, when you do them enough, you got to. And then I watch myself on video, and then I would listen to myself, and I'm like, ah, I got to change that. You got to. You just kind of got to go with it, and you just. I think the. I mean, it's like any. It's like anything. When you go to a concert and you see a performer that's a professional that has been touring for a long time. OK, you go there and most people are like, wow, they're just blown away. Well, that's because they've been doing it. And as a musician, when you do it constantly, you get comf more comfortable, more free. Uh, you can ad lib and 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 it's really tight. You know, it's it's great. It like they say, practice makes perfect. And, and to me, performing is practice. You know, every show is different. And you'll learn something new. And uh, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. It's as simple as that. I mean, if you gig like, you know, five times a year with your garage band or whatever, and, and then you go and then afterwards you're like, yeah, oh, that wasn't so good, man. It's like, well, that's because you got a gig. You got a gig three, four days a week. To, you, it's like exercise. You, gotta, you just got to keep up with it. You got to do it. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember Craig Manoa. Or not? Craig. I talked to I I talked to Craig uh, last week. Well, he's uh, behind the band Cloud Cult. Cloud Cult is another you know local act that has grown very big, mm -hmm. and they tour around and they're uh, doing uh, um, you know they're they got they're you know they're very they're very well known. He Craig's down in, in Madison now, um, but Craig did DJing like 
I've done DJing and you've done DJing, and you know it's not it's not the most respected form of uh, of art, but doing you know weddings and uh, right. and you know retirement parties and stuff like that. And I just wanted to tell you something, or sort I was going to play it for you, but I'll just I'll just paraphrase as much as I can. One of the things that Craig talked about is how doing um, that kind of DJing, where you have to work with so many different kinds of people. And you have to just be, you know, quick thinking and all that stuff. He said that helped him to work on some real stage fright issues. Oh yeah, totally. That he had, and uh, and it it it's like a, it's almost like a school. Yeah, I mean, if you're speaking in front of hundreds of people at like a wedding, I mean, that's like the biggest day of their life, you know. And uh, and everybody's watching you when you got your microphone on. It's good. It's good practice. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. That'll. That'll get you, uh, that'll, you'll get some practice in with that. Yeah. So this is how he started off, you're saying? Well, he was, he did, he did singing and, uh, and he, same thing as you, you know, he, he played music. He didn't expect it to go anywhere and it just has exploded into this, into this big thing. And, and, uh, I, there's actually a documentary about Cloud, Cloud Cult. That's what I was talking wow. to him. And he, um, yeah, we should watch it sometime together. But he uh, went, have, had just a lot of really uh, challenging experiences. But uh, one of them was getting used to that feeling of I'm in front of people and I everyone's watching me and getting past the idea of are they making fun of me? Do they think mm-hmm. I'm a big loser? Do they, yeah. you know, and moving those... Th- things um i don't know how you do it but like just moving them into the back of your mind or just moving yeah past you them? just you just gotta be you know I, I i go out there and most people wouldn't probably jump on tabletops and and you know sing to people and embarrass people and 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 do crazy things like that and uh i just don't have any uh i don't care what, what what's is it called liberties or what what's the deal uh i'm trying to think of the right word to describe that i don't have not scruples it's not that <laughs> it's inhibitions inhibitions uh maybe it could be i just i just i'm just people just accept me for who i am i guess i just i just pull it off that way where where i'm not embarrassed about it you know what i mean if you go out and you do something and you're embarrassed by it and it, and it shows in your performance i mean obviously uh, you know, that's that's going to happen. That's mine ringing. That's mine. That's my phone. I had it on vibrate, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a loud vibrating noise, isn't it? It sure is. Um, you can't be shy about it, you know? Just Just go with it. If you make a mistake, you make a mistake. It's not a big deal. Don't apologize for your mistakes. That's the one thing that I think you taught me years ago is never apologize. Like, oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't really good. Or uh, we're going to do one of our originals now. I hope you like it. No, 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 no. We're going to do one of our originals. You're going to love it. That's. And never ask an audience, how are you tonight? How's everybody doing tonight? You say, I'm feeling great tonight. You guys are going to feel great tonight, too. It's going to be a great night. And you just you just go in there with that confidence and you grab hold of your, you command your crowd. That's what you do. Of course, it is kind of hard in some areas to do that. You are just doing music now. Just music, full-time, that's it. No full-time job. That's it. Booking myself. I'm my own manager, my own art director, stylist, roadie, uh, sound engineer. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes all at the same time. I'm actually the sound engineer today too for you. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, what Todd's saying is we're, uh, we came out to Todd's little, uh, studio here on central Avenue, uh, in his man cave. And, uh, if people want to get a hold of some of these originals, do you mean, do you have even have any CDs? Is it all like, uh, you know what? I, I recorded uh, 10 tracks a few years ago and really never finished them as far as mastering and stuff. But they all are available on my website, toddeckhart.com. And make sure you get the name spelled right. E-C-K-A-R-T dot com. Yeah, that's it. I'm such a stickler about the, my spelling. Well, because there's, a, there's another guy that's Todd Eckhart with an H. Todd Eckhart Band. 
There's a Todd Eckert band. There's a Todd Eckhart band. I'm the only Todd Eckhart band. What is it? E C K A R T. A R T, like Art Garfunkel. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, buddy.